All right, well, good evening, everybody. Again, my name is Laura. I'm the Public Programs Coordinator here at the First Division Museum at Cantini Park. This is your last kind of warning that if you are seeing closed captions at the bottom of your screen and you'd like to turn them off to please follow the directions that are on your screen. You can go ahead and click the live transcript button at the bottom and select hide subtitles. Or if you like them, you'd like to change them, make them bigger, make them smaller, you can do so by using the subtitle settings um, and selecting closed captions at the bottom of your screen. But before we get on to this evening's presentation, and I'm pretty excited about this one, um, I want to let everybody know a little bit about what is happening this month and next month at the museum. So let's talk a little bit about it. First and foremost, always have to talk about what is coming up next for the Date with History series. Our last one for 2021, can you believe that? Our last Date with History for the year 2021 will be on Thursday, December 2nd, and we are welcoming author Dr. Robert F. Jefferson. He's going to share with us a little bit about his book, Brothers in Valor, the battlefield stories of the 89 African Americans awarded the Medal of Honor. So, of course, you can always sign up for that presentation on Zoom. Um, by visiting our website, fdmuseum.org. Go ahead and sign up there. Again, that one, we always start at 7 p.m. Central Standard Time. Last but not least, I would be remiss if I do not mention that next week, Thursday, of course, is Veterans Day, a very busy day here at our museum. Um, we are going to be having our extended hours as we traditionally do from 4.30 to 8 p.m. The museum will remain open. Uh, you can learn a little bit more about everything that's happening at the museum that evening for Veterans Day by visiting our website. So please sign in for that. I will say we're having a 5.30 p.m. moment of thanks to all of our veterans in attendance. So if you are a veteran and you're looking for a place to spend your Veterans Day evening, come spend it with us. We'd love to have you. And last but certainly not least, if you are a fan of the Date with History series, you're going to love our sister program that is done by the Robert R. McCormick House, um, which is a part of our museums here at Cantini Park. So they have a wonderful new program. It just started in October and it is called Headlines from History. It highlights historic moments that made headline news on the Chicago Tribune. And I'm pretty excited about the one that is happening on November 17th because it is going to cover what is arguably one of the most famous headlines from the Chicago, Chicago Tribune ever, which is the infamous Dewey defeats Truman headline. <laughs> So I'm excited to learn more about how that happened. Um, but that is going to be done by historian Sam Rushe, and he is joining us from the Harry S. Truman Library and Museum. Again, you can sign up for that program by heading over to cantini.org. All right, everybody, let me get this screen down. I'm going to pass it over to Kurowski Salter, our executive director, and he's going to get us started for this evening. Okay, thank you, Laura, and uh, welcome everyone. I'm going to go ahead and uh, do a few housekeeping chores, and then I'm going to introduce our speaker. So uh, first of all, uh, many of you have joined us before, but for our date with histories, we will save the last 15 minutes to Q&A. And when you do, uh, when you have a question, use the question and answer feature at the bottom of your screen. And my teammate, Laura, We'll get to as many of those questions as possible. She'll pass those over to our guest, Patrick O'Donnell, and uh, he, he's going to uh, uh, take as many of those as possible. Also, we have been very fortunate this year and last year during the pandemic to not have uh, any significant technical difficulties. And I say significant, we, we did have one or two uh, small ones and Laura fixed them on the spot. And so if we have any tonight, uh, we apologize up front, but I know Laura will continue to do a good job and keep the program uh, rolling. Also, I believe tonight is one of the programs where we have the Illinois teachers uh, where they get credit, right, Laura? So, uh, so Patrick, you are actually a professor uh, and instructor tonight too, because if you don't know, uh, we have a program where teachers can log in and get credit uh, for attending some of our date with history. Wonderful. And, and they, they have uh, certain parameters that they uh, take away. And so with that, this is where I really go and read the bio. And I'm just going to do a short read because most of you have seen the, uh, the bio. And then I'm going to say a few things. And hopefully I can tee Patrick up. Uh, great. But 
this is an extreme honor for me to be introducing Patrick O'Donnell, because as most of you know, he is a combat historian. And you know, what does combat historian mean? You know, in the military is a combat veteran. He's a combat historian because he's actually been in combat and written about the experiences of soldiers being on the ground. So he's a combat historian. He's a best-selling author, a public speaker, and we're gonna hear some of that tonight. And he has written not one, not three, not five, not seven, but 12, 12 critically acclaimed books uh, that recount the epic stories of America's war from the American Revolution to the Iraq uh, War. Uh, he is currently a fellow at Mount Vernon. Uh, he is the recipient of numerous uh, National Book Awards, and he is a premier expert on elite and special operation units and irregular forces. And so with that, I'll just kind of go a little bit off script. So, you know, when we talk about combat veterans, and this is another one of your books I've been kind of perusing through, Patrick, mm. you know, uh, we were uh, one, this is a book that he wrote being embedded with the Marines. Uh, so maybe one day he'll come back and talk about that. Uh, for some of you who logged in earlier, uh, you got to hear our private conversations. One book I can't wait to get is The Indispensables, which is the most recent book, came out in March. And it is, uh, I'm not going to say much more. Patrick, you can tee that up later on. But tonight, we are very pleased to have Patrick talking to us about the unknown. And so what this story is about is a group of men uh, and American figures and one unknown soldier a hundred years ago today who were in the process of their journey to create what became the tomb of the unknown soldier. And so what is key and what I found about uh, Patrick's uh, writing and what I have read, he is a master of taking a small part of history, sometimes a small image, which is why I'm not gonna spill the beans on the undispensable for those of you who haven't read, taking a small piece of history that most of us don't know about and, and, and bring it to life in a bigger fashion. But what we also find is we do really know about that small piece of unknown history because we all have known about the unknown soldier, but now because of Patrick, we know how that came to be. So Patrick, without any further ado, I'm gonna stop talking and turn it over to you. We are pleased to have you tonight. It's really an honor to be here, and thank you so much for that beautiful introduction that really captures the essence of my books. And like I mentioned to you earlier before I got on, all the books I've written, I've written 12 books. I've been a full-time author and historian for 22 years, and I haven't worked a day because this is my passion. <laughs> but all of the books I've written have found me in one way or another, and they've all been a journey. And it's really been a special journey. And the... Um, the unknowns is, is not an exception to that at all. In fact, it's, it's really kind of the model. And the unknowns comes about um, by way, um, indirectly, of the book you held up earlier, which is We Were One, Shoulder to Shoulder with the Marines that Took Fallujah. And uh, as you mentioned, I, was, uh, I served as a combat historian. I was embedded. I was in a Marine rifle platoon. I wasn't behind the wire. I was clearing <laughs> houses with the Marine Corps in the Battle of Fallujah. And uh, it just happened to be, I was also in the, the platoon that had some of the highest number of casualties. We had five killed mm -hmm. in the platoon I was in and my squad alone had three. Wow. And the main character of We Were One was uh, a Lance Corporal who was shot in front of me um, as we were clearing a house that was filled with Chechen insurgents. And I dragged, I dragged him out. I thought he was uh, still alive, but it was a, a mortal wound. And, yes, um, but that gives you an example of kind of the intensity of the combat. And uh, it was a brotherhood and bond that I sort of formed with those men that still exist to this day. And it was that brotherhood and bond that led me to France in 2010. Mm -hmm. um, I was asked to be the guide for the 5th Marines at first, and then later the Wounded Warrior Regiment because Colonel Buell, who was the, um, the battalion commander 3-1 who I was with, invited me and asked me to do that. And I, was, I, I gave them a tour of Normandy as well as Bella Wood. Mm -hmm. And um, as we were in Bella Wood, I was sort of the secondary guide there. Um, our main guide 
uh, took us through, you know, a forest that is still, it's still scarred by war. It's a moonscape in some cases. Yeah. And some of the trees still contain mustard gas. So I was there with the men that, some of the men that I was with in Fallujah, and that was a special moment to have a situation where we were touring a battlefield where nearly a hundred years earlier, these, the same Marine, the Marines that um, were their forebearers uh, fought. And it was the two generations coming together. And it was um, World War I that changed the world. It was World War I it also changed my life in the sense that the Middle East was, was changed and shaped uh, through World War I. And we were there and we were walking the, the sacred ground of Bella Wood, where in 1918, the, the second division, as well as other units, uh, the third division, were rushed to the line to stem the the gap that had been created in the French lines that had basically an open door in many ways to Paris. And it was at Bella Wood that they made a stand in other places. And as we walked this sacred ground, uh, it was a really special and, and personal experience to all of us. And we walked to a place called Hill 142. And Hill 142 was really at the very beginning, uh, early stages of the battle where the Americans take the offensive and the Marines charge across an open wheat field. Um, and many of them are cut down with like a scythe uh, by machine gun fire by the Germans. But the 49th company makes it through along with other men and they seize Hill 142, which is a high ground near uh, Bella Wood. And it's here that the story of the unknowns kind of finds me. Um, so as what I'm going to do, there. Patrick, uh, I'm going to I'm, so I'm going to cut my camera off so you can continue to talk to the uh, to the audience. Um, and I've been there twice, so I I know what you're talking about, but I I like to kind of log off so you become the focus. But I'm still going to be listening. Sounds good. All right. All right. Thank you. As we were going through uh, the the wooded ground of Hill 142. My other guide mentioned to me that it was here that the first Medal of Honor for the Marine Corps was earned. And, and that was the beginning of this story. Uh, let me take you back in time. It's, it's June 6, 1918, and the Marines have charged across this wheat field into the guns of the Germans. And uh, miraculously, they seize the hill. Um, they're, they, with bayonets, with hand grenades, um, show show machine guns and 1903 rifles, anything that they had. And they were able to seize this hill, but it was a very tenuous capture because in, you know, according to German doctrine, they immediately counterattacked. And these men knew that that counterattack was coming. And um, they, they, they quickly uh, prepared themselves and sure enough, the Germans tried to sweep the hill very quickly. And it's here that Ernest A. Jansen springs to life and literally saves that hill and maybe part of Bella Wood. Uh, it's here that the Germans are um, initially trying to dig in. They put position several light machine guns on the side of the hill and Jansen lets out a blood curdling cry and fires upon them first with his 1903 Springfield and then all bayonets several of these German soldiers as they're setting up the machine guns and disrupts the entire process. Had they been able to set up the machine guns, they would have probably swept the hill and recaptured it, which would have had a, it could have had a very negative course on history. And Jansen uh, saves a day, is very, very badly wounded. And what makes this interesting is that Jansen receives the first, he, he earns the first Medal of Honor through that action. He earns two Medals of Honor. He earns the, the Navy Medal of Honor and the Army Navy, uh, the Army Medal of Honor. Uh, during World War II, up until that point, they would, if you served in a joint service, in this case, the Marine Corps was under the command of the Army Second Division, they received both medals. And um, what's interesting also is not only did Ernest A. Jansen have two medals of honor 
he had two names. And that is probably the most interesting part of the story. He, his the name was uh, at that time was Charles Hoffman. He had changed his name because he had gone AWOL to visit his girlfriend while he was in the army. And at that point he was, uh, he left, <laughs> he had left the army and never returned and then joined the Marine Corps under a new name uh, um, as Charles Hoffman and uh, served very in a very distinguished manner and receives the Medal of Honor. And it's here that, that, that the story begins because he receives the Medal of Honor, but he's also something very special. He's a body bearer for the Tomb of the Unknown Soldier, which is the, which is the book that I wrote, The Unknowns. It's about these body bearers. And each one of these stories was handpicked by General Pershing and they were deliberately handpicked to tell the story of the entire American expeditionary forces in France. And it was a joint service cho choice. There was the, the Navy was chosen as well as the army. And then within that grouping of eight men were uh, the combat specializations that would tell the story of the, of the infantry, the cavalry. We had cavalry soldiers in World War I. Combat engineers, um, field artillery, heavy artillery, railroad guns that were employed, and the Navy. And the Navy stories are really quite extraordinary. And the book also tells a ninth story as well. And that is the story of Edward Younger. And Edward Younger is an infantryman in the second division who sees the worst of World War I. And I tell his story. The book is a combat history of World War I through their eyes. And it's told in a, in a band of brothers fashion in many ways. For instance, we tell uh, Jansen's story through the 49th company and follow it through the entire war. Um, but these stories are compelling, they're graphic, and they capture the essence of World War I through the eyes of these men, which are some of the most decorated heroes of World War I. Um, you know, going forward, the, uh, the next story in the book begins in August, 1917. And this is the story of James Delaney, body bearer James Delaney. And James Delaney's story is quite interesting and unique. Um, it's it, it, the story, the setting of this story is on a merchant ship, the SS Campana. And James Delaney is a, an, a, a naval seaman who had had many, many years of experience with the US Navy. But in this instance, he was, a, uh, he was in charge of naval guards. And these men, their job was to, to, to basically guard merchant ships. The Navy supplied the, the, the guns, they were bolted onto merchant ships and uh, they also supplied the crews, but the, the, the merchant ships would pay these men and, and then also feed them. But the reason being is there was this, the, the threat of unrestricted warfare uh, U, uh, undersea warfare, the U-boats were devastating um, America and the Allies by sinking uh, ships left and right. And before the war began, President Wilson actually authorized these naval guards to go on ships. And they were basically there for defensive purposes. In the event that a U-boat attacked a merchant ship, these men could fire back and defend the ship. And it's 1917, August, the war had already began, uh, had, had started. And the Campana was returning uh, to Spain uh, with a load of, of cargo, and they were they were bringing it towards the uh, to, for the Allies eventually. And it's here that a U-boat sights this uh, lonely steamer that they suspect is unarmed, um, and the commander of this U-boat. His name is Diekman. He's a very experienced commander uh, that has many kills uh, to his credit. He's nearing, well, ace status. If ace status would be 50 boats that he had sunk, he's close to it with 43. And um, he uh, sees this lonely steamer and he decides to fire a torpedo. And that torpedo barely misses the steamer. And um, 
torpedoes for a U-boat that were very precious. They didn't have many of them. So he decides to surface far enough out of their range, as he thinks, and starts to shell the, the steamer with his deck gun. And what ensues is a, um, a cat and mouse chase that lasts for hours. The steamer tries to avoid the U-boat, but at the same time, the U-boat is pursuing the steamer and both ships are firing at each other. And there's a running uh, gunfight. And literally hundreds of shells are exchanged. Um, and it's really an epic, epic uh, engagement. And Delaney and his crew are firing away. Their eardrums are, are bleeding because they've, they've uh, thrown so many shells at this U-boat. A single hit will take out the U-boat. And, and Diekman knows that. So he wisely keeps his boat far enough off that the shells are barely missing it. Um, and he, his shells are starting to hit home. One shell hits the, um, near the ship, uh, near the um, engine room of the ship and uh, several other hit. And it's the, at this point that Delaney is running out of ammunition that he fired so many shells and his crew fired so many shells that the captain of the boat sees it's useless. And um, they basically decide to surrender because they have no choice. They, the um, U-boat has more torpedoes as well as still has ammunition and they surrender the Campana. And this is really, you know, an extraordinary scene. The, um, the crew get into lifeboats. They, um, the, 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 the crew of U-boat 61 then boards the Campana. And uh, the first thing that they do is steal all the food that they can see in sight because they have been eating you know, rations that are in the U-boat. And they also take uh, soap and they clean themselves because U-boats are extremely dirty. They're filled with diesel fuel and fumes. These men wash off and uh, they steal anything of value. And then they set charges and mines on the boat. And uh, as this is happening, other crew members uh, then take the men that are in the boats and they find out who uh, or are the members of the Navy and uh, as well as the captain and they take them on board U-boat 61. And this is a DOS boat of World War I. It's probably the only um, DOS boat experience, if you will, the movie DOS boat being what my reference point that an American has. And they literally uh, live on board the U-boat for several weeks. And they experience all of the, uh, the hardships of being on that U-boat. They're depth charged. They, um, they, they um, interact with, with something called a Q-ship. Um, the Allies are so desperate to take out these U-boats that they disguise merchant ships as harmless merchant ships. As soon as the U-boat surfaces, like Deakman's, the um, the, the um, compartments within the Q-ship open up with guns and they fire upon that U-boat. And that's exactly what happened with Diekman's, with Diekman's ship as well as Delaney and this, the captured crew. But they're able to, to uh, uh, escape unscathed. They go through a minefield. And then within all of this story is really an incredible interaction because Diekman speaks perfect English and he, interrogates Delaney and, and interviews him. Uh, Delaney gives him a bunch of uh, answers that are not true. Diekman's wise enough because he knows what the log boat is, the log uh, book is on the ship. And um, they have an interaction. And what I find really compelling about this story is that you have two men that are enemies, natural enemies, form a mutual respect in the crews the American crew and the German crew form a mutual respect because they live in close quarters for weeks on this U-boat. And they go through uh, the shared hardship of the undersea war and they barely escape with their lives on so many occasions. And um, this culminates with Delaney and the crew um, sailing into Kiel, uh, which is the German main U-boat base and um, after they, they make it to this, this port, they snap a picture of both crews. And it will be the last picture 
ever taken for the crew of U-Boat 61. Within weeks, they are never seen again. Diekman and all of his men are lost at sea um, and they're never heard from or seen again. And uh, it's just the beginning of the nightmare that James Delaney and the rest of the crew members have to, to endure. They, um, they are taken into captivity by the Germans and they, are, they go into a stalag, but it's, it's harsh. It's really hardcore. Uh, many of these men are starved to death because there's just really not much food in Germany either. And they have to endure uh, ex ex immense suffering uh, and starvation. Delaney literally uh, tries to escape several times and he's partially successful, but rounded up, nearly shot, um, but survives. And he survives and is, uh, is decorated with um, the Navy Cross for his efforts. Uh, and he eventually will be one of these men that General Pershing selects um, to, to carry the, um, the unknown soldier uh, home. Um, but moving forward, there are you know, eight different body bearers in this book, as well as Charles Younger. And one of those stories that is in the same vein as uh, James Delaney is Charles Leo O'Connor. And he's also dealing with the undersea war. Um, he doesn't know it at the time, but it's September um, 1918 and his ship, the SS Mount Vernon is a, um, really has a fascinating story. It's a repurposed German ocean liner. Uh, prior to the beginning of the war, the United States did not have a lot of transport ships and uh, they had to, to resort to building ships. But in this case, they also resorted to seizing a German ship. And this ship um, was a German liner that had docked near Maine at the beginning of the war to avoid the Royal Navy. They thought that they were going into a neutral port but it was, uh, it was seized. They didn't, America didn't want to violate its neutrality, but there was also something more, um, another reason, a more compelling reason why they took that ship. It was loaded with gold bullion in its hulls. Millions of dollars of German gold was in the, uh, this German ship and it was seized. The crew and all of its passengers were detained and it was soon repurposed. It was given a dazzle pattern, camouflage paint job to avoid at least the, the roving eye of U boats. And it was repurposed and redesignated the Mount Vernon. And it's here that Charles Leo O'Connor has probably the dirtiest job in the Navy. He's in the bowels of the Mount Vernon as a boiler man, and he's a coal tender. He is feeding the massive furnaces of this ocean liner, which is about two thirds the size of the Titanic uh, with coal every day. And he's, you know, develops this hulking body, but just imagine living in, in, in working in hell um, for, for years. And that's where he is at. And um, his, his job is disturbed by um, initially with, with the mariners on, do, on top deck of the Mount Vernon, you is an ominous sign, maybe a lucky sign, some of them. There's a rainbow, but the rainbow um, is only, is, is something that they see shortly. And then they see the telltale signs of a torpedo heading right for the ship. And um, the captain of the ship goes into evasive maneuvers they're not able to avoid the torpedo and it detonates right near the boiler room of Charles Leo O'Connor. And this is where really one of the great stories of World War I that until the unknowns, few people had really ever heard about. O'Connor um, decides to make a split second decision. To, instead of saving himself, He's got scalding water from the boiler and ash and cinder from the, from, the, um, from the furnace on him. He's being burned alive. 
he closes the watertight door, which saves the ship because it, it, it seals a major compartment within the ship. Had that flooded, the ship would have sank. And uh, O'Connor closes the door. Um, he saves several men in his compartment. Other men uh, tragically die because they're not able to go through that watertight door, but they save the ship and he is burned alive uh, practically by uh, the scalding water and the hot ash. And he somehow makes his way up the ladder and he's immediately transported to sick bay. But they've got a major crisis on their hand. They've got a torpedo that hit the ship. It's listing very heavily. Damage control goes to work immediately. They put pumps to work. They, they, put, they brace it with wood, where the, the, the hole that's springing out, anything that they can. But within the ship is also a microchasm of what's going on in the world. It's a raging pandemic. The, the um, influenza of 1918 is raging on the ship. They are transporting men that are coming from the, the front that are sick and the ship is infected. And so they're dealing with a pandemic on the ship. They're dealing with a sinking ship and they're dealing with the U-boat that's still out there. And the commander, uh, the captain of the ship is going through evasive maneuvers. He's ordering depth charges. He's firing his deck gun and he basically suppresses the sub and it, it departs, but it's out there still and they don't know where it is. And they're still going through, um, you know, all the issues that they have to deal with, uh, with the pandemic, with the ship that's about to sink. And it's really an extraordinary story of um, men against a U-boat against the sea and against the pandemic. And they all, they somehow prevail and they were able to save the ship and survive. And that is, that is just another one of the examples of this, the stories in this book. And then you have um, Edward Younger, who's the man that will select the, the unknown soldier. And Younger is a doughboy of World War I that goes through pure hell um, in the second division. Many of these men are in the Second Infantry Division, and you know, remarkably, they converge. Um, several of them that are in the Second Division converge on the night of November tenth, uh, uh, 1918. and it's here that we have one of our bloodiest, bloodier days of the war, and it's the final hours of the war. And uh, General Pershing is obsessed with defeating the Germans at all costs and making sure that they know that they're defeated. And he's ordering an attack. And the second division is crossing the Meuse River. And they're crossing this river in a very arduous circumstances. They have small ladder-like bridges that are made out of, of wood that, are, that one man can cross at a time. And they're crossing the night of November 10th and 11th under heavy artillery fire. Many men are dying uh, as shells explode in the river. And it's the second engineers that build the bridges, which is one of the men in my book. Um, it's Edward Younger, who's there supporting that effort. The field artillery um, of one of my men is in this book and he's supporting the crossing. And it's Ernest A. Jansen's platoon that are also was crossing that that river that night and barely surviving and uh, they they get to the, the they cross the river and they dig in and they were repel uh, numerous German counterattacks and barely survive on November 11th at the 11th hour as the guns cease and they record that that feeling of how there's massive, the cacophony of machine gun fire, there's artillery, all these things, the, the, the sounds of war suddenly halt and there's silence. And then there's something very bizarre that occurs. The German lines erupt in cheers, acting like they had won the war, which has many of the men absolutely dumbfounded. And uh, the book, 
that's the be the end of the the war phase of this book, which the body ballot bearers and, and Edward Younger tell that story. And it's the beginning of the ceremony and the actual tomb of the unknown soldier and how it came about. And um, each of these men then will, will once again, or most of the eight will then join again in Washington, DC. But um, in 1921, exactly 100 years ago, uh, next week, the Tomb of the Unknown Soldier is, uh, is, is brought home and interned in, in Arlington Cemetery. And um, the story of that, of the Unknown Soldier is, is remarkable. We did not have a, uh, plans for an Unknown Soldier at the end of World War I. There were roughly 3,000 Americans that were still in France that were unaccounted for. I mean, heavy artillery, many men's limbs, and there, it had it made it rendered many of the bodies uh, impossible to identify. But the army, of the War Department, still believed that they could somehow bring back all these men and identify them. And that was at least the story that they gave people. And there were also tens of thousands of Americans that were still there, their bodies. And um, what happens though is first France um, designates an unknown soldier. It's followed by the, the United Kingdom. And it's the, there's a movement in the United States to honor our boys and to honor all veterans of all wars with an unknown soldier. And it starts with a grassroots movement. Um, there's first a movement to bring home all these, the, 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 the men that are there and families are given the option of bringing home their loved ones or leaving them um, to rest in France or in Europe. And uh, many Americans decide to bring their, their boys home. Um, but there's a decision, a, a, a grassroots movement springs up by a very powerful woman editor by the name of Marie Maloney. And she uh, runs a paper called The Delineator, a magazine. And she urges the War Department and her fellow Americans that something needs to be done. We need to have to honor our men. And uh, she creates a groundswell. And it's followed up by a very important uh, congressman, Hamilton Fish from New York. And Fish's story is captured in The Unknowns as well. But what makes it so interesting is Fish was a white officer in an African-American segregated unit. And Fish um, saw the extraordinary courage of the men that he served with. And he looked at the, the tomb as, an, as a way to honor their sacrifices. And they had you know, undergone racism and segregation and this was a, an opportunity to, to honor them. And Fish jumped all in and really spearheaded the movement within Congress. And um, it's President Harding that eventually um, gets everything through the finish line, funding. And then it goes down to how, how, do, you, how do we select an unknown? And uh, Grades Registration Unit is brought to France and uh, they go to five of the major cemeteries where we fought most of our major battles, where, for instance, there's a, a cemetery, um, the Saint Marne Cemetery, there's one at Saint Michel, there's one of the Meuse Argonne. Uh, unknowns were exhumed at each of these cemeteries, and then they were checked to see if there's any kind of dog tags, paperwork, anything that I could identify these individuals. If they had passed those tests, the body was then uh, very carefully removed and the graves card that that body was associated with was burned. They did not want to know, have anybody go back and figure out who these men were. It was then brought to, uh, the bodies were then brought to Shalom, uh, France, where they were, they lay, um, in rest in, in the city hall there. And um, it's there that um, 
Edward Younger comes into the picture. And Younger is still one of the doughboys that is still in France in 1921, because there's still occupation work going on. And the, uh, the plan was that night to initially have a general officer select the unknown, but the French said, no, you should really have an enlisted man do it. And literally that night, they selected Edward Younger because his record was such that he had been through, he was sort of the quintessential doughboy. He had been through hell. I mean, he had been through all the major battles. He had been combat wounded um, at a place called Blancmont, which was an epic battle for the second division, which General Pershing and uh, would later say was one of the greatest battles of the war. Um, survives that, they crack, uh, the German defensive positions there, and he survives, and he's chosen to select the unknown soldier, which is this awesome responsibility. And he's given that that option the night before. And he wakes up the um, the city hall. The the five caskets are draped in American flags, and he's given a a bouquet of white roses and told to select the unknown. And uh, I remember reading his original handwritten notes where he said that he was trembling, he prayed. And his, you know, as he was walking forward to these, um, these coffins, these caskets, he felt his hand literally move as he put the flowers on one of the, the caskets. And he felt that it was a man that he had somehow served with and he had known. And that is the story of the Unknown Soldier. And it's brought back on a ship, the USS Olympia, which is still in existence, it's still in, in Philadelphia. You can visit that ship. It's a remarkable ship. The ship goes across the Atlantic. The, the, the Unknown is placed on top, on the deck, because the casket literally can't get through um, into the hull properly at least that's what they said and that, that was almost a giant mistake because the ship goes through a massive storm and the body is nearly washed overboard the marine complement of guards that are on that ship literally lash themselves to the casket to protect it as it's going through these high seas and uh, it eventually makes its way to the Washington Navy Yard on November 9th and it's there that the body bearers, the eight men that I've detailed in the unknowns, um, greet, the, greet the unknown and they escort him to, to Arlington Cemetery. And that is where, you know, a hundred years from now on Thursday, that ceremony, which I detailed for the first time in the unknowns will be, um, reconstructed to some degree. It's one of my suggestions. And, um, and we will recommemorate America's uh, greatest, arguably our greatest war memorial as we remember the boys of World War I and we remember the World War II generation, the Korean War generation, there are three unknowns in the tomb, as well as all Americans who have served in all wars uh, beginning with the American Revolution forward. And the tomb is, is about not leaving anybody behind. It's about uh, sacrifice. It's about who we are as Americans. And with that, I'll be happy to take your questions. I'm sitting here talking to you and I'm on mute. I want to thank you so much, Patrick, and I really hope that this um, kind of whets our, our, our guest appetite to really get their hands on a copy of your book, The Unknowns. Um, such a fascinating story. I'm going to actually start us off with a couple of questions that I had come in, and one of them is sure. about um, Sergeant Edward Younger. Now, I've read the book, so I'm aware that Sergeant Edward Younger is from Chicago, um, so he's a Chicago native, but can you tell us a little bit more about um, what happened to Sergeant Younger after his big moment um, in history, serving in World War I, followed by the selection of the unknown soldier. In your book, you talk a little bit about how um, 
that decision weighs very heavily on him. What was his life um, after his World War One service? Which what we see in in all of, all of the stories is they are all touched by war, and many of them carry the scars of war, the invisible scars of war in some cases. And you know, younger carries not only the physical scars of war, the fact that his, he has a bullet wound in his leg, but also the psychological scars of war, and it's sort of evident in a very um, sort of a it, it, he brushes upon it. Um, and you can see it in some of the other men too. Uh, they still they still feel that war. And um, Edward Younger is employed after the war. It sort of fades into obscurity to some degree, is employed by the Postal Service. Hmm. And um, you know, like many men, he has a, an interesting view of the war uh, after the war. And uh, in some ways he's embittered a little bit by it. And he's an isolationist. He doesn't want, he doesn't, you know, want to go back to war at all. Um, and he sort of touches upon that a little bit uh, prior to the entry of our, our entry to the war. Mm. He's a, such an interesting person too. Um, the next question we were having coming in was um, in regards to identifying unknown, the unknown soldiers. So we've had um, other unknown soldiers, of course, um, also be laid to rest at the Tomb of the Unknown Soldier, some of which have been identified um, as time progressed. Um, you mentioned that there really was no goal to ever identify the Unknown Soldier of World War I, but with technologies, do you think there, there will ever be an opportunity to identify the World War I Unknown Soldier? I think it's very possible that that could easily be done uh, with DNA analysis. Uh, and that's exactly what happened with the Vietnam unknown soldier. The, it's really quite a compelling story. It was a, um, an airman that had crashed in Vietnam. And uh, the family was absolutely convinced that that was their son. And they went to great lengths to prove it. And they, um, they were right. And, uh, you know, they, they got an order to, to check and, and sure enough, it was their son. And he was removed from the tomb and uh, you know every one of the soldiers in the end every one of the unknowns is receives the medal of honor and that was actually re uh, removed with him and um, you know I think that the, the, the positive here is that they they now have closure uh, obviously and the, the, he was new, he shouldn't have been in there to begin with mm -hmm. um, but what the three men represent is who we are as Americans. It represents the service and sacrifice of all Americans uh, in war. And uh, I think it's possible that they could identify those individuals. There's never gonna be another unknown soldier with you know, DNA analysis, obviously, but they all represent um, the, you know, the sacrifice of, of Americans in, in, in war and why we fight too. Mm -hmm. In the book, you share uh, stories about the actual funeral service um, in itself. Did you share a um, moving story about General Pershing's attendance um, at that service? Could you share us a little bit about uh, Pershing at the at the funeral service? Yeah, I'm what I like what, what, what I like about Pershing is um, sort of his humbleness in the sense that he could have ridden on a horse, but he decides to walk. Mm -hmm. And he really has a re profound respect for his men. The man had a chest full of ribbons. He decided not to wear them. He only wore one, one ribbon, one, one medal, which was the World War I victory medal that all Americans that had served in World War I received. That was it. Um, and he just had this sort of uh, humble nature to himself, even though he's a very, he had a towering personality and was a very uh, strong leader. Um, but he was all about kind of uh, making sure that people received credit. And that's something you see in the unknowns, very deliberate effort to, to that the services in the book, the Navy and the Army and the Marine Corps all receive credit uh, for what their, their sacrifice. No, not really one gets more than the other in many cases. Mm -hmm. they, they all receive credit and they all deserve it's, it was his goal to tell the story of World War I through their eyes with the selection of these men. Yeah. 
and that, that's a really uh, a moving story. So I want to thank them for bringing that up. How many how many are currently laid to rest at the Tomb of the Unknown Soldier? Currently, there are three. There's the World War One soldier. There is the World War II soldier, and there is a Korean War soldier that are in the uh, tomb itself. Mm. And um, while we're talking about the tomb itself, um, I was wondering if you could provide us a little bit of insight. When the when the Tomb of the Unknown Soldier was first opened um, almost 100 years ago, it looked and uh, guests interacted with it very differently than how we interact with it today at Arlington. Can you tell us a little bit about what it would have been like 100 years to go to go visit the Tomb of the Unknown Soldier? The, the tomb did not, um, one of the things that's sort of an institution around the tomb is the tomb guard and the, um, the precision of their drills. Uh, they come about in the 20s because the tomb is literally open to the public and in some cases desecrated. There are people that come at night and they, um, there's graffiti or there's things, bottles laying around and things that are they're really desecrated so there's an order to put the tomb guard in place and they're there and they're you know really one of the most extraordinary parts of the military i think uh you know every day of the year every minute they are guarding that tomb and they're performing their their um their steps their their drills and uh it's really you know an extraordinary thing for me it was um i was uh be, given the honor of being an honorary member of that unit, which is insanely that rare. And then I was given pleasure of going underground to the tomb and seeing, you know, how they prepare. And uh, probably the biggest honor though, was that these men um, all have to know the history of the tomb. It's part of their training. And I uncovered so many details in the book that it's now incorporated in their training, which was a really a, a special thing for me because I, I first visited the tomb when I was five years old and uh, it's always been a special place to me. I wonder if you could provide a little bit of insight. So we have the Tomb of the Unknown Soldier at Arlington National Cemetery, but I believe there are other unknown soldier memorials elsewhere. Um, are you familiar with um, any other ones located around the United States? Yeah, there is. Uh, there's a number of, uh, there's quite a few um, unknown soldiers, if, if you will. Um, in, there's, in Arlington, there are, there's a tomb of unknown soldiers that are, that are from the Civil War. In Philadelphia, for instance, there's a tomb of Revolutionary War unknown soldiers that, you know, tragically in 2020, it was desecrated with graffiti. And, um, you know, that was really a shocking thing to me. Uh, there's, there are unknowns in many places. And uh, it's not, there, for instance, I wrote a book called um, Washington's Immortals. And Washington's Immortals is about the Maryland 400 or Washington's, they're also called Washington's Immortals and they make an epic stand at the Battle of Brooklyn. And they, they, this American Thermopylae literally saves the United States. But to this day, we don't know where the bodies of those men reside. Many of them are suspected to have been uh, brought into captivity by the British and many uh, were put on board um, what were known as hell ships in New York Harbor. And uh, they were, you know, in the hulls of these ships, which were floating concentration camps, men died of disease. And then their bone, their, you know, their bodies were just thrown overboard like a bag of trash mm -hmm. and their bones would literally wash ashore. And there is a massive memorial to the unknowns of the revolution in Brooklyn where the bones of these men, there are literally, you know, thousands of bones and skulls that are placed in this, this memorial itself. Wow. And uh, so... I was familiar with the one in Washington Park, but not familiar with the one in Brooklyn. Um, and just very reflective in the fact of how um, lucky we are today that we we have technology. So we will ideally never have another unknown soldier. That's a wonderful thing to know that we may never have another unknown soldier. Um, 
as we go forward with this, I was wondering, you talked a little bit about World War One as kind of this like catalyst moment for um, memorials and public memory and wanting to have very public um, places of remembrance. What do you, do you think there was something very special or unique about World War One that kind of created this global moment of creating these public spaces of remembrance? Oh, in so many ways, um, World War One is one of the most significant events of the 20th century. It, it changes the world. Empires that had lasted thousands of years or hundreds of years are now diminished. The Middle East is remade. Modern war is created. It's the beginning of the American century, modern medicine. I mean, there are just endless things that occur um, that flow from World War I. And the, the memorial is, is very special in many ways. It's, um, it's a way uh, to, to honor all of those that served in this, this great war, uh, which America wants to do, but it's also a way to heal wounds. And um, all walks of American society are invited to the tomb. For instance, the NAACP is there. Um, there are soldiers from the Civil War, the Spanish-American War. Um, the DAR, I mean, you name it, the, the American, all walks of American life are at the tomb to honor this man or individual. And, uh, you know, it's, I think what's really quite remarkable too is one of the men in the body bearers is a, is Native American and he's Cheyenne warrior and he's chosen, but the person that they choose to preside over the ceremony is Chief Plenty Clues, who's a Plains Indian chief that is had previously been at war with us. Um, but that was done deliberately to heal wounds. And he's given a very significant and large role uh, in the ceremony. Mm. And he places his uh, war hammer on top of the, on top of the, uh, the casket. question coming in about um, the French and we had, um, how did the French come up with the concept of the tomb of their unknown, which I believe, I believe is, is that the Arc de Triomphe? Is that, I believe that is the location of their unknown. There's, the, the, there's, um, their unknown is, it sort of organically sort of springs up and it, it comes about and they, they decide, you know, very deliberately to, to choose an enlisted man to 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 designate the unknown and uh they go through you know this really remarkable process and the english do the same and then it's and then it comes to you know an, an organic movement here in the united states grassroots movement that um that brings about our unknown soldier mm -hmm. And of course, there's um, other ones, I believe the one, um, Tomb of the Unknown Warriors at Westminster. So they're definitely out there and it's a beautiful way of remembering. Interesting question. Has there ever been anything done specifically for female soldiers that are unknown? Well, we don't have, um, at least in the United States, any female unknown soldiers that we know of, if you will. So... Yeah, interesting question. Absolutely. Yeah, uh, there's not, I mean, it's, there was not, uh, it's, there was not a, uh, you know, a, an opportunity to, 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 to do that, even though it's, it's theoretically uh, possible. Absolutely. So we only have about two more minutes before we wrap up this evening. So I want to leave you with one kind of um, final question or thought to kind of end our evening on. Of course, this is a very, um, a very timely topic as we get closer to the centennial anniversary of the service of the unknown soldier. Um, but I wanted to kind of wrap up this evening with why do you feel like Veterans Day and the Tomb of the Unknown Soldier. This is a perfect time for everybody to go out and start learning about this as we get close to Veterans Day. I just think that it's, um, I think it's probably more necessary than ever in many ways. It's a sense of unity and healing, um, maybe like it was a hundred years ago. 
So it's something maybe we need now more than ever. Um, it's, it's about so many American values that are represented in the tomb. Uh, it's, it's about, you know, sacrifice. It's about courage. It's about um, why we actually fight for liberty and freedom. You know, it's also about leaving no Americans behind concept that's, you know, something we should revisit maybe. Um, there's a lot to it. And I think uh, it's a special place that is, that has a lot, there's a lot there. Um, it's who we are as Americans, as I closed my presentation. Thank you so much. And it really is. Um, I know many of us who are listening this evening have, have probably visited this uh, visited the tomb and visited the memorial and understand the power and weight that that location has. And I hope that this story and your book helps bring even more um, story and weight to the location as we think of those whose kinds of fates all drew them together to surround and honor this one very specific soldier whose name to us is unknown. Um, so I want to thank you again. And I want to remind for the last time, all of our guests, I hope you're able to join us the evening of Veterans Day here at the museum. Across, and I would love to have you out and love to see us, and we hope to see you there. And if not, we will absolutely see you at our next virtual date with history on December 2nd, where we're going to be learning a little more about the 89 African American soldiers who have received the Congressional Medal of Honor. Thank you to all of our veterans for your service who are in attendance this evening, and we're looking forward to seeing you soon. Have a yeah, good thanks night. Thanks, everyone. everyone. Great job, Laura and Patrick. Thank you, and we hope to have you here in person. I'd love that. I'd be honored to do that. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. We'll stay in touch. Good night, everybody. All right. Good night. Good night.